all athletes can be very successful in business yeah. if they just use the same concepts and yes. the same mindset that they did. If you ever get to a point where you stop learning, you are going to get defeated. <laughs> you had to every day be ready physically in the pros. What's what's right. cracking, everybody? Money Smart Guy Matt Zapala here, healing to you from the Money Smart Woman team headquarters here, home of the Seven Figure Squad. And I have on the Facebook Live today, man, two time, not one time, but two time <laughs> Super Bowl champion cornerback, right. Ray Crockett, Ray, uh, straight from Dallas. And uh, guys, Give him some love because he's right now recovering from COVID-19. So, so give him some love. Ray, great to have you here, man. Man, it's good to be here, my brother. Like like I said, man, uh, before we went live, I, you know, I've been following, ever since we've met, I've been following your footsteps and, and trying to look, learn how to be an untrep athlete. <laughs> 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 I love it, man. But no, man, I, I've been following you and, of course, PBD, Patrick Bet David is my guy here in Dallas. You know, yes. right there at the headquarters of PHP. Backyard. So I'm trying to figure out how can I be down. <laughs> As we continue, Bob, we got we to we give a quick shout out to uh, Pastor Rashawn Bay. Yes. Uh, he's the one that actually originally connected us out of Gulfport, Mississippi. And uh, I, I want to show I want to show a picture. Let me show a picture here, right quick of what, what went down that day when we met, uh, because it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty funny uh, us having a conversation. And by the way, it was, it was, just, a, it was just a pleasure to meet you. But he, he had us down, he had us down, Pastor Bay had us down. Let me show three, two, one, you should be seeing it, sharing it. All right, there it is. So Pastor Bay hosted a, a, a <laughs> workshop down in Gulfport, Mississippi, and here we are. I'm like, man, I get to be in the same room as a, not a one-time, but a two-time Super Bowl champion. And then uh, we had a conversation, man. I think the first question I asked you, uh, what was it like to play with Steve Atwater and, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, against uh, Brett Favre and all that, because, you know, I'm Chicago Bear and all that good stuff. But uh, and, yeah, right. you played for the Detroit Lions. You got drafted by the Lions. Right, exactly. But but the premise for this conversation, to, to help manage expectations, that's, that's everybody's uh, watching this live right now, is we had this conversation about money, entrepreneurship, obviously sports, because I'm a frustrated jock. I'm a wannabe. Never, never. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a Joe and, and raise a pro, obviously, and you know, Pro Bowl champion. <laughs> but it was this picture because we we're sitting next to each other in the chapel, and we we're comparing rings. Right, right. right? And, and I was like, "Damn, right! Look at that." As guys do, <laughs> <laughs> as we do. You know, what I'm saying, no matter what walk of life you come into, you, you see jewels, you see cars, and boom. You know, that's just what guys do. <laughs> yeah, no judgment, no judgment. This is no like, judgment, <laughs> no judgment. Not, not even, you know, not even living on that spectrum. It's just, it's like females. What do females do? They compare jewelry and shoes. We compare jewelry and cars. It's it's it. just, I go. <laughs> Fair enough. There it is. And so uh, I made a comment your ring. I said, man, man I wonder what it's like, man. I would, I would love to have your ring, you know? And yeah. uh, and you made a and comment I came to back me. And made a comment. I was yeah. like, no, I looked at it, it's so symbolic, you know, because that's what rings are to guys, just like females. You know, they can't wait to get that ring on their finger. Well, for us, most of the time when we wear a ring, it's symbolic of something. So yeah. for me, wearing the Super Bowl champion ring that I don't really wear that often, that that's a big time symbolism. And then when I looked at your ring, I, I inquired about. You know, what's the symbolic, what's the symbolism of your ring? And when you told me, I was like, that's the ring I want. <laughs> I, want those rings. Uh, I mean, I understand, you know, the Super Bowl, you know, I, I understand what the value of that ring is. But that that is, I, I, I really look at the Super Bowl as being a, a once in a million time type valuable thing. You know, something that not everyone can get. You, there's a lot of luck and, and blessings and all that stuff that has to be involved in that. But when I, we spoke about your ring, I'm like, that's a ring that everyone can shoot for. It's hard work to get it, but you can physically and you can realistically shoot for it. Like a Super Bowl ring, everybody can't shoot for that. Let's just be real. Everybody can't shoot for that. That's you know, you gotta be blessed, God gotta do a lot. But but your you know, symbolism of your ring, I'm like, here's a guy that's that's proving and that's showing the world that anyone can shoot for that because we we look at being successful and, and success on different levels. 
But greatness and all that, all that stuff is, is, is inside of you. Everybody can be great and successful on your level. So when I looked at your ring, I'm like, man, that, that's the ring I want to shoot for, and that's the ring I want up to help other people get. Wow. Wow. That's, that, that's amazing. You know, uh, just a little bit of your accolades here, man, uh, about, about your career. For those of you uh, watching right now that doesn't know Ray Crocker, uh, we got a lot of millennials. You got to forgive me. Right. We got a lot of millennials. Oh, of course. We got millennials. Of course. I mean, Gen X is like me. We, we know who you are. But, uh, hey, but uh, for the millennials, the younger generation, that think that uh, LeBron James, the GOAT, not Michael Jordan. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, you were called Mr. Everything, Mr. Everything by the Lions. Right. Uh, there is a, uh, I think it goes down as probably the most incredible taunt of all time is when Troy Aikman, you got what, one or two yard line? And you're yeah, in the corner. Yeah, they were, they were going in on the five. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Right. And you, you backpedal, you saw him look, guy does a square out pattern. Right. You, you cut, you cut, the, you cut, you jumped the route. Yeah. And, and oh. the strangest thing about that, I was actually playing safety on that play. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, we talked about what you consider yourself and, and that's why they named me Mr. Everything, really, because that year when we went, the first year, of course, the Lions ever, they had won a playoff game. That's the only playoff game they've ever won was against the Cowboys that year. And, and that year I played inside linebacker. I covered Metcalf and all those great running backs out of the backfield. I played outside linebacker. I covered some of the, uh, you know, the, the tailbacks when they split out wide. I yeah. played safety. I covered all the top tight ends that we went against, and I played corner, and I covered Michael Irvin and Andre Risen and all those guys. So that's why they named me Mr. Everything that year. Wow. <laughs> I, I, think, I think you've innovated that position because today, I mean, they're looking for safeties to do that. You know, you're well, in corner doing today it. Today, I would be known as the honey badger. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> from from uh, LSU, right? Yes, I was the honey badger before the honey badger. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, if you guys don't know who, uh, uh, that team, I mean, there's some amazing uh, players that Ray played with. Uh, you play with, obviously, John Elway. Right. You know, John Elway. On defense, you play with uh, Romanowski. Bill Romanowski, Steve Atwater, Steve Atwater. Famer, Neil Smith, Alfred Williams, John Mobley, Tyrone Braxton. Oh, man, it, the, the list goes on that. Let me tell you, that Denver Bronco team, the craziest thing about it is, and, and you can relate to this from what you're doing now and from, from what you've done as well, being in the forces and everything, and and everything, I, I feel nothing happens on accident. Everything happens, you know, because there's a rhyme and a reason. Yeah. And when I was in Detroit, when I got drafted by Detroit, my draft class was – by far, I mean, one of the strongest draft classes, you know, with Elway and the quarterbacks, Jim Kelly yeah. and all that. Generation X knows that draft class. But in 89, I, the year I came out, we had Troy Aikman, Derek Thomas, Deion Sanders, Barry <laughs> Sanders were four of our top five picks, all Hall of Famers. <laughs> then you had Steve Atwater who went to the Hall of Fame. He was in that draft. I mean, Andre Rod we had – I mean, our draft class was just stocked with, with talent. So Jeez. we play, I play John Elway, Hall of Famer. I play him Thursday night. My first start, my first start, this is my second year in the league. My first start is against the, I'm in the Detroit Lions, it's against the Denver Broncos on Thanksgiving. Okay. National TV on Thanksgiving against the Hall of Famer and the Amigos, those, those crazy receivers they had. So I picked Elway off twice that game. And after the game, Elway tells me, man, if you are ever free, if you are ever a free agent, because this is before free agent even started. He's like, man, if we ever get free agent and you free, I'm coming to get you. And wow. just, so just so happened, it all happened. My first year, my contract's up. I'm a free agent. And Elway comes to get me. Wow. <laughs> and, and look, and as they say, the rest is history. You know, two Super Bowl wins later. Number one offense, of course, with Terrell Davis and all those guys. Shannon Sharp was on that team too, right? Shannon, Shannon Sharp, Rod Smith. Terrell Davis, Elway. Uh, um, the tackle we had was how I think it was five Hall of Famers on offense. We ended up with I think one, two, two Hall of Famers on D. Yeah, so it was a it was a <laughs> loaded loaded team. Yeah. So, so what, what a question I want to ask you. And by the way, before I go into the questions, I, I want to know, uh, right now, I think it's very relatable right now. 
you know, the COVID, the COVID-19 case, people testing cases are, are spiking. States are going back to shutting down again. You're, right. you're, and you're going through COVID right now. You tested positive COVID. I, man, I just got my negative today. I'm, I'm just, I'm released in literally probably 20 minutes before this call. I've been sitting on pins and needles. I went and retested yesterday and been sitting on pins and needles. And, and this is the first live uh, ESPN is going to do a little conversation with me about COVID and everything. But you beat them to it. This is the first live that I get. I beat ESPN, baby. <laughs> that I get to announce that, yeah, I'm, I'm free. I'm negative. Wow. But man, when I, I, I want to tell the world, whoever's listening, Send it out there. Send to add this to whatever you, you know your media outlets are. It's no joke. It's it's real for everybody out there. You know, I know that the Republican side and the the you know Democratic side. Anybody, it's a host, and some people don't want to. I don't know about all the re rhymes and reasons why you're wearing masks and everything, but I will say, be careful, as because it felt like death the first couple of days. Really? Yeah. Oh man, it was. Yeah, it was. And, and I'm a guy who, as you well know, I try to stay in, in decent shape. I mean, for my age and, and, and for what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, working out is definitely a part of, the, of, of that life. So I would tell everyone, man, to, to do so. Do something. Get, yeah. get your heart rate up. Get your body in motion. Do something to, to, to be prepared just in case. You know, it's just as anything. Now, don't live your life. Now, I, I tell people this. I don't live my life in fear, and I won't live my life in fear going forward. Mm -hmm. But I will, on a day-to-day -day basis, be prepared. Just as yeah. just as you got insurance for your house, insurance for your car, you're not getting it because you're expecting to use it. You're getting it because you're, you're, you're wanting to be you know, prepared. And yeah. the same thing I say about this. You're not working out and eating right and taking your vitamins and, and, and keeping yourself in shape and your immune system together to get COVID, you're doing it to be prepared not to have it. So yeah. that's what I would say, because it sucks. It does. It sucks. Those first four days, I had no clue on uh, what was going on. You what know? was your symptoms? What was your, what were we going Man, through? I, let me tell you, the first, the first day, I was in and out of consciousness from time to time. You know what I'm saying? I was, I was, I would be sitting up breathing funny, and all of a sudden, it would be a woo, like, you know, to me, yeah. I would associate it to some stingers, you know, like I would have yeah, a yeah. finger as they call. Right. They were really concussions in football. Yeah, it's stingers, stingers. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm saying, you know that from, from being yeah. in, the, in the service, yeah. hitting the ground with your head, all of a sudden you're like, whoa, wait a minute, yep. slow down. That's kind of how I was feeling. I was feeling, I had those wait a minute moments. You know, I'll be sitting there doing, like the St. Francis working out, and I don't, as we call it, you know, from being in the sun, you overheat. Yeah, you're you know, sure. Like engine, exhaustion. Like, yeah. yeah, it's kind of like a car engine. You overheat. And that's what I was doing. I would work out and all of a sudden, heat would shoot to the top of my head. And and my whole body just, just felt hot. And I'm like, oh, wait, because I'm an athlete, I know what that is. You know, I ran track. I know, I sure. know what overheating is. So I, I would uh, put ice on my, you know, my neck, my, my uh, crown on my head. Try to cool that engine down, you know, get it back down. So I, I just kept doing that for about for about a week, to be honest. So I probably already had it and didn't know it because yeah. I didn't I, I wasn't I didn't necessarily have a fever. I, I didn't have you know all, all the other symptoms. But then I flew and I had a trip and I had to go do some business, and it cultivated it all cultivated that day. Like uh -huh. I I went did a TV show and uh, you know came back to my to my place where I was staying and when I tell you profusely sweaty like drenched and wow. I'm sitting there just just soaked in sweat wow. and I'm like you know I'm like what the hell is going on and then I went from that day make me put in some hand sanitizer right now man <laughs> yeah 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 for sure <laughs> just thinking about it <laughs> I went on from that day though and I still, here's the sad, and this is us, you know, athletes and, 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 and guys in general, I can beat this. You know, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, yeah. show must go on. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm down here to work. I'm down here for a reason. I'm going to go complete my task. You know, you know yeah. that. And sure. So I'm like, okay, let me take me some medicine. Let me take me some, some allergy pills or whatever, you know, something. I got up, 
went to go do the uh, second show, and then that's when it all like really hit. I went to after the show. I was at the office all day at the studio. After the show, we went to a early brunch lunch. You know, to, mm -hmm. to say you know, a hey, job well done, dude. I'm eating right, and I'm and I'm I'm not having a big appetite. But I'm eating anyway because I know it's my time to eat. You know how we do. Right. Look, it's two o'clock. I gotta eat. Chow so time. I'm not really hungry, but I'm eating. And I picked up a jalapeno pepper and <laughs> tasted nothing, no heat, no nothing. And I'm like, what? I'm like, uh oh. <laughs> You you're right. hot in a jalapeno pepper. Yeah, I'm like this ain't right. So then I picked up. I asked the uh, waitress. I said, "Can you do me a favor? Can you bring me a, a cup of onions?" Because I'm, you know, now I'm thinking. You know, now I'm thinking. COVID. Now I'm like, all right, I done overheated. You know, I'm sweating profusely. Now I can't taste nothing. And I'm like, oh hell, man, I got it. So I said, "Can you bring me a, a thing of onions?" She's like. Onions, I'm like, please just, you know, look, just humor me. So she brings it to me, and I put the onions literally on my nose. Couldn't smell anything. So yeah. I'm like, so I called my, my uh, sister, changed my flight to the 6 o'clock in the morning flight, came home, and the crazy thing was I got in the uh, Uber. I got in the Uber, and, I, and, I, and I've called all these people, of course, that I bet that I was around after I got it to make sure they were good, they were all good. Want to make that a special note. Don't get this and don't tell nobody, you know, whoever you've been around. But so I, I got in the Uber, and all I remember was getting in the Uber and just, like, in and out. And the next thing you know, the Uber driver goes, this is your house, right? This is your house. And I'm like, I, I look up, and I'm like, yeah. I don't even remember the drive. I don't remember the drive uh. from the airport to Uber. Like, so I must have just, you know, just slept, passed out the whole way in the car. So at that point, I got straight home, went in the house, got in the car, went straight to the hospital. I went straight to the hospital, and they, they tested positive. And lockdown city from there, you know. Wow. Just fighting the diarrhea symptoms, the headaches, and all that stuff for, for three or four days. It's every, Of course, everybody don't get the same symptoms, of course. But for me, the first three days, it's, it's real and kicking. It's live. Yeah. Believe it. Look, believe it. <laughs> take, what, take precautions. All that what, stuff. What was your first thought when they said you're COVID positive, COVID-19 positive? What was your first thought? Because of the way I was feeling, nervous. Nervous. I mean, I, quite frankly, I've never been nervous about any, you know, being sick or anything like that. Because I know me and my body, I'm, I'm going to be, you know. Yeah. I, I, there's never been an injury that I feared because I always felt, you know, I can make it through it. I'm a workout warrior. I can make it through it. But this time, yeah, I was nervous because I'd already seen two former players pass from it. Oh, wow. Around my age. You know, I'm 53. I'm proud to say it. I'm 53. I'm not a young, you know, young Chippewa. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm 53. So, I started, and I have a slight heart condition as well. Mm. That's part of the reason why I continue to work out, you know, 18 years or whatever after retirement. So I got a little nervous. I did. I got I got a small hint of anxiety, and and I have anxiety problems already. Yeah, know, yeah, sure. Yeah, because of concussions and everything. But I, I did, and and I just, man, I just, I'm gonna be honest. I got what I I got real spiritual. You know, I'm already spiritual as it goes, but. I just had to keep relate, you know, relating to myself. God is in control. You know, I have nothing to fear. Yeah. I don't have to worry about it. I just have to get up and, and, and do something, you know? Right. So that's what I did. I just, every day, I just wanted to make sure that I did whatever I needed to do or whatever I was in control to do. And I let God control the worst, the rest. But I, yeah, I was nervous at first though. So, so what was that, Ray? You, uh, there's no vaccine for it. There's no medicine for it. So what did you do? Man, let me, here's a funny thing. You're going to laugh at this, man. When they when they call and tell me, hey, you got it, right? There's like no doubt about it. You got it. And I, you know me first. You know me as as a natural human and a natural guy. You sure? 
<laughs> what, what, what you talking about, Willis? What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> Look, yeah. I work out every day. I wear masks. I got hand sanitizer. I make hand sanitizer. I ain't got it. You sure? They yeah. like right. They was like hundred percent. We sent the medication over to CVS by my house. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, do I go get it or what? They said, preferably no. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, preferably no. We want you immediately locked down. You know. So I'm like, okay. So I, I called and I said, okay, I get someone to go pick the, the medication up for me, right? They bring it to the house. This is Z-Pack. It's I'm it. Like, it's I'm it. I'm like, you just told me I got COVID-19. You get, did you? Look, I'm reading on the thing. They must have put the wrong damn thing. <laughs> that's all. So that's that's it. That's that's all they got available right now to answer your question. It's a regular Z-Pack, you know, that you get with the flu or whatever, when you're feeling bad, which I already had a couple of Z-Packs at the house. I keep them on deck. I was like, I didn't even need you to send that to CVS. But yeah, right now, there's no vaccine at that, you know, that's safe, quote unquote, to use. You know, if you want to use what Trump said use or whatever, try that on your own risk. I, I ain't about that life. Yeah. <laughs> right yeah, yeah, now, yeah. look, right now, what I know of, there's nothing safe. So yeah, man, it's a Z-Pack and all you have to do is immediately load up your immune. Um, actually, you should do that now. Don't wait till you get COVID. But if you do get it, immediately load up your immune system. You talking about what, that? Yeah, that's it. That's what that's what it is right there. Take two the first day and four after that and pray. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, but I'm so glad you can laugh about this stuff, man. Jeez, I'm so glad you can laugh it off, man. Woo! Well, I, believe me, had you called me, like I said, those first four to five days, it was, it was, it was more prayer than anything. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I did. I mean, and, and it wasn't only because of, of, of COVID. Sometimes you just have those times in your life, those seasons in your life, where, where you, you know, where, where prayer, and, and that's how. I, and it was a good thing for me, though. It was a good thing to have it because it made me real just my mental mindset, it made me readjust myself and, and, and my actions, you know what I'm saying, and, and my day-to-day. -day. And, and now, man, day-to-day, -day, I'm, I'm, I'm back on, on my routine. But strengthen your immune system. Eat the, the, the right foods, you know what I'm saying? Get yep. the right vitamins. You got to load up with, with, the, with the vitamin D, the C, the the B twelve, you know, yep. Put yep. all that stuff in your system, man, and and rest, cause you know we live in a world where everybody is saying, you know, the early bird gets the worm. If you ain't up at four thirty a.m., you ain't trying to be successful. I'm sorry, I don't buy that bull crap. <laughs> <laughs> Look, your body needs to rest. If you want to, you can get up at four thirty a.m. and just be up. What that mean? Yep. You know what yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It don't mean nothing. Now, if you have something to do at 4.30 a.m. and you're really being constructive, you know, and, and you're doing something good, yeah, but if you're just trying to wake up to tell me you beat me up, that means nothing to me. Get your, your body needs rest to, to, you know, to be able to fight this thing off. You got to sleep because that's what I did the first three days. I literally was, was in and out of sleep all day. In wow. and out of sleep. Uh, so that just told me one thing. Whatever I was doing, I needed some more rest. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I wasn't yeah. getting a proper rest because my body wouldn't have reacted that way. So, yeah. What worked for you? What was proper rest for you? Some guys get six, some guys get eight. I mean, there's a debate about how much sleep one really needs. What what worked for you? You know what really works for me? I'm, I'm going to be real uh, when, when it comes to that. I'm normally in between that six hour around that six, especially now with me being 53. Now, when I was younger, I'm not going to lie. When I was younger, three hours, four hours, I, I, I was, a, you know, because I was a busybody. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I I literally used to wake up when I, you know, my younger days, 5 a.m., 5.45, I'm on the track running. You know, I get three workouts a day. You know, I did all, but that's why I played a decade and a half in the league. But now, as I'm older, as I'm older, my body, of course, you, you, you need to rest your ligaments and all of that stuff need, you know, comes into play. So now I'm around six to seven. I'm in there. Yeah. Six to seven feels good for me. Good. And even within that six to seven, man, 
I'm a napper. I'm a napper. I'd be the first to admit it. You know, I, if I get me a good workout in, especially a, a strenuous workout on the track huh? or something. Sure. Man, 2 o'clock, 2.30, you might find me somewhere. <laughs> 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 and, I, and here's the thing, man. I used to be embarrassed. I used to be embarrassed, like, to tell people that I just took a nap. Yeah. Like, they called me, hey, man, what you doing? Oh, man, I'm working. I'm doing a little. Now, hey, man, let me hit you back in 30. I need 30 <laughs> more minutes. Look, I'm going to need 30 more minutes, and then yep. I'm going to be good to go. Because, yeah. because what I realize is that creativity does not happen when you're tired. Yeah, no. Creativity happens when your body is rest, when your mind is, you know, at yep. ease. So all of those things, I, I learned that rest helps all that you know it, it helps you to be successful so i'm not ashamed to say it but yeah i'm i'm you know and and, and you know if it, if it need be i'm gonna push it you know i'm gonna, I'm gonna sure. do what i what has to get done yeah. but always i'm one of those guys i say you may have a long day you may get up one day at four o'clock in the morning and work all day but somewhere after that day there needs to be 10 12 hours of sleep somewhere you need to look, you need to bring that heat down on your body. You know what I'm saying? You don't need to go seven, eight, nine, ten days with sure. a schedule like that. You yeah. know? Yeah. Because then it's oh, you know, because then it becomes overheating it just like an engine. Your engine's gonna burn out eventually. Wow. So so Ray, let, let, let's talk about let's talk about um your time in playing football. What what do you think was was the biggest difference for you from playing at Baylor and it in in, in in college? And then going to the pros. What was, was there a mental shift? Was there a physical shift? Uh, obviously, there's a financial shift. But I mean, what, what was a big difference for you between the college and the pros? Man, the biggest for me, it was definitely a mental shift. But more so than anything, what people don't realize, and and I, I just finished my book, by the way. It's called Bump and Run. So I I, oh, I, yeah, I, awesome. Yeah, yeah. You, you're telling me we're with uh, Pastor Bay. By the way, Pastor Bay's watching right now. He's, he says, what's it, up? I literally just finished it. So, yeah, so it's called Bump and Run. So it kind of displays this whole story from, you know, high school, college to the pros and into the after. You know, so it gives uh, depicts a whole uh, – it gives you that whole uh, vision and, and that flight with me. But I would say it was more so from high – now, from high school to college, physical. Physical, 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 physical. Because as in my book, you'll find out, I got cut my freshman year because I was 5'2 and 113, 14, 15 pounds. <laughs> I didn't even make the freshman team. They didn't even, didn't even give me a shot. They didn't even give me a you know, look. I went out and, and, and tried out, and the coach asked me if I wanted to be the ball boy. So I was very embarrassed and went home. And so for me, I was always labeled too small too small, too small. So when I finally, my sophomore year, I ended up starting four years on varsity. And I, I had a, a, look, thank God I had a growth spurt from my freshman year to my sophomore year. I grew about five inches. Wow. You know, so I went from five, two and a half, five, three to five, eight. And, and now not, I'm still small. Don't get me wrong. I know five, eight is not that big. I'm still small, but I was, able to go in and put, you know, and, and, and compete and yeah. compete. And once I, you know, once I got a chance to compete, my, my God given talent, I started three years on varsity. And then from I'm five, nine, 167 pounds. When I go to Baylor, my, my freshman year, wow. so I'm still small. And dude, when I tell you, I got to Baylor and we had Thomas Everett, Ron Francis, I mean, Ray Berry. We had all these guys that went pro off of this team. Like, my first two years at Baylor, we finished, like, number nine in the nation and number 10 in the nation, you know, and, and probably literally 13 guys went pro off of that team. Mm -hmm. So they were, you know, stopped. So I'll go there, and I'm going against all Americans my freshman year at 160 pounds. And Thomas Everett, who was Jim Thorpe, went all – all-American, two-time, Jim Thorpe winner, all that stuff, you know, can play for the Cowboys, two-time Super Bowl champion, that Thomas Everett. Jim Thorpe went, you know, so I, he would pick me out. He's a junior. I'm a freshman. He would pick me out because he knew the talent that I had. He knew that I had speed and all that, but he knew I was small and I wasn't tough because I didn't do nothing but, you know, cover guys. I never tackled mm -hmm. anybody. I just covered. 
So that's why my book was called Bump and Run. That's all I ever did. So he would pick me out and just literally beat the living crap out of me, like in tackling drills, tackling. So I knew right then, I said, I got to get in this weight room. I wasn't a weightlifter. I, I was fast. I ran track. At that point, I, I made a, a, a conscious decision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, to get bigger and stronger. Yeah. So I went from 167 my freshman year to by the time I got out of my freshman year, I was 185. Strong. I mean, I was muscle. Rock. muscle. Lean, lean muscle, yeah. Uh, straight lean muscle. Lost a little bit of speed, but but I needed to. So, yeah, so that was a big adjustment. Was was all about physicality, you know, because everybody was strong and fast. And then once I got bigger enough, then it was all mental at that point. At that point, every step is is – is adjusting and learning. And if you ever get to a point in any, and I'd say this with business and everything, if you ever get to a point where you stop learning, you are going to get defeated. <laughs> Somehow, some way you're going to lose. It doesn't mean you won't be successful, but you're losing something regardless. Sure. You know what I mean? You can yeah. still be eating and all that stuff and still be losing. So at that point, from, from my time at Baylor, I was dominating you know, my sophomore year, my junior year. And so I started looking for new new ways to challenge myself mentally. Like I started saying, you know, if I if I played this guy this way, mentally, can I overtake him? You know, mm-hmm. yeah, so, so I started challenging myself mentally. And then when I got to the pros, it was all mental. Because now you got... Really? I, I covered, man, I cut... I mean, it was physical to the point to where everybody was a physical, you know, specimen. Sure. But... The, the difference, the physical difference was this. In college, I had some pancakes. And we call pancakes guys, you know you're going to dominate. Sure. So there were some, there were some games I went in, I was like, oh, God. Oh, you, yeah, you manhandled. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah uh, sure. Okay, okay, you know, okay. You're making a lot of noise, but you ain't saying nothing. You know? That, sure, sure. I had some of those in college. Now, in pros, you don't get those days. So that's where the physicality came from, was, was you had to every day be ready physically in the pros. Yeah. But from a mental standpoint, if you wanted to compete, there's no room for, for mental mistakes in the pros. You're getting paid now. You know, it's your job. So in the pros, the adjustment was the mental adjustment and the organization adjustment. Because in high school and college, they walk you everywhere. This is where you got to be. This is what you got to do. This is what time you're there. In the pros, they give you a platform and a booklet and a playbook and say, come back knowing what the hell you're supposed to be doing. So now you got to organize yourself and you got to get mentally astute because we call it repeat offenders. If you blew a play or if you were a repeat guy, a guy that blew, you have to leave. Ah, <laughs> like, see, that's done. the difference. I'm telling you, dude, yeah. that's why That's why there's so many, you know, you, you look at the average is three and a half, four years in the league when I played. Those guys were the ones who didn't take the mental part seriously. Were they physically gifted? Of course, they made the team. They're in sure. there. Yeah. But they didn't do the organization and the mental part. They weren't organized, and they weren't mentally, you know, astute. So they got weaved out because every year there's a new guy wanting your job. Mm-hmm. You know what yep. I mean? Yep. So how, how do you hold that guy off? You hold that guy off by your reputation now. You hold that guy off by a coach saying, I know I can count on Ray Crockett. Ray Crockett going to be physically in shape. Ray Crockett going to know what the hell he's doing. And he's going to be where he's supposed to be when we need it. Those are the things that, that holds that young guy at bay. Okay. If you're missing any of those three things, that young guy, you'll be, look, you'll be the statistic now. You three and a half years. <laughs> cut, you cut. Not even seen your second contract. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Three and a half, four years, yeah. Goodness gracious. So when, when, you th- when you talk about improving the mental game, uh, how did you start stepping up your mental game? If everything's all equal physically, what was, there, was there, what was your preparation like to prepare for the game? Because all these guys are scheming. Everybody's a stud. You know, they're scheming. Right. Cover two, you know, cover three, cover four, all, all this stuff. And you're looking at, you know, you look at these offenses, uh, you know, and because you're, you're a cornerback too as well. So the, the, the hardest thing, when, when I was a wide receiver – and I'll go up against a corner. I, I do a couple of juke moves because I know what's going on. I, 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 know the, I know the play. Right. But as a corner, you're reacting to what wide receiver is doing. So there's mental exactly. preparation in that. Exactly. Things that you're reading. 
So, so how, how would you about that? That's that's why my book called Bump and Run is is what I premise it on because Bump and Run, my name of my book is Bump and Run. It made me a save me. Bump and Run was my go to technique. And the first thing you have to do mentally, you have to know yourself. Know thyself <laughs> before you know I'm anyone taking, else. I'm taking notes. <laughs> Before you know anyone else, you have to know thyself. And, and, and when you say know thyself, the first thing you have to know is, what's your weaknesses? See, most people who, who look at know thyself, the first thing they talk about is their strengths. But the first thing you have to know is what's your weaknesses? Because what's going to get you beat is not your strength, it's your weaknesses. So for me, from a mental standpoint, I went straight to what are my weaknesses? What am I? What am I not good at? What do, What do I need to get better at? What coverage? Like, if you looked at from zone to man, what? And I went through every coverage: cover two, cover three, quarters, cover one, blitz. Which one of these coverages am I the weakest at? And I started getting better at those things because you're only as good as your weakest link, and that is on a team. You know that in the force or whatever, that's yeah. on the team, but that's also yourself. Yeah, people don't look at it like that, you know. So I had to put down all of my skill set, and I said, "What's my weakest link?" So that's what I started attacking because what is a coach? You as a wide receiver, you just said you play wide receiver. Yeah. You study film and you look at a DB. What are you looking for? You looking for his what? You looking for his weaknesses. weaknesses. Right. You looking for his weaknesses. Exactly. You want to say, is he quick? Is he fast? Is he strong? Is he smart? You look. You are looking for all those things, right? Yeah. So, okay. So if if you're looking for all those things, so then you go, all right. You as a wide receiver, you start to say, okay, man, this guy has no weaknesses. <laughs> so what does that do to your game? Oh, uh, it's like, well, it, it makes me want. Well, I got to improve, and then you might even get my head. Hey, there, that's exactly what you do when you say this guy has no weaknesses. The what it does to your opposition, it makes your opposition take risks that he normally don't take. Oh, now his game is screwed up. Yep. You know Let what I'm saying? This. Because he's yeah. overcompensating. He's overcompensating trying to beat you. He's overcompensating looking for a weakness. But see, a lot of DBs that I played with, they didn't do that. I, I used to always say, dude, why do you continually work on your speed when you are already fast? fast. <laughs> of like, work on your lateral movement. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Work on your strength. You know, work on your tackling. <laughs> you know, do the thing, because you can always finish up working on your speed. You already got that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's, that's mentally how you, and then the other way is take notes on your opposition. Like for me, every wide receiver, I had a notebook. I had a notebook from Jerry Rice to Chris. I covered 13 Hall of Famers. So I had a notebook from Jerry Rice to Chris Carter to Michael Irvin to Isaac Bruce. All of them had, I had a notebook. And they all were in there. Every time I played them, I wrote notes. I wrote notes. If you look, if you're not writing down <laughs> your plan and you're not writing down, you're going to forget. There's something you're going to forget. So write it down. Make it visible to you because what's visible to you, most people can have a, a better visible memory than they do a regular memory. Sure. You know what I'm yeah. 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 So what's visible to you, that's what's gonna help you the most. So I took a note. The first time I, I remember the first time I played Jerry Rice, I was my second year in Detroit. My second year in Detroit, I played Jerry Rice. And I fortunately I I, I made it out of the game. He didn't score on me. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's it. And, and and here's the thing, and here's the thing you, you have to understand. You have to put realistic goals against, you know, your opposition and those guys. So my realistic goal from him was, I know I wasn't going to shut him out. Be realistic with yourself. That way you don't get so far down. So I knew I wasn't going to shut him out. So if he caught a ball on me, it didn't bother me. Got it. My, my goal was he's not getting in the end zone. That was my goal. Nice. I'm like, because, cause, you know, he's, he's destroying guys. You know, I'm watching film and I'm studying it. It's great. And, and Jerry Rice was one of those guys that I'll tell you that I studied that had no weaknesses. You know, everybody said he was slow. But every time I turned on the film, he was outrunning somebody. I'm like, <laughs> somebody lying. <laughs> he don't look slow to me. 
So then I say, okay, he ain't strong. Then I would see him battling, you know, on the line of scrimmage with Dion or with um, Ronnie Lott or somebody like that. And I'm like, okay, he is strong. You know, Rob Woodson, he was – I said, so he's, he's strong. Yeah. Then I see his routes, and I'm like, ooh, he's Chris. nasty. So, yeah. yeah, so I said, you know, he really was one of those guys that had no weaknesses. So, in that moment, what you do when you go up against a guy that has no weaknesses, you exclude him and you work on you. So I said, since he has no weaknesses, I'm not gonna have any weaknesses. <laughs> That's right, right. You know what I'm saying? Right. You don't, you don't, off, you don't offset it by doing more. You offset it by honing in. So that's that's how you know I I would I would say, from a mental preparation, I took notes on everybody, which I didn't do in college. So that was that was an adjustment. I took notes on everybody. I took notes on myself, which I didn't do in college. When I was in college. I never would go back and watch myself play. You know what I'm saying? But when I was in the pros, after I watched my opposition, I go back and watch me. Because what I wanted to find out was what is the next coordinator trying to say I didn't do well? Mm. Because if they see, if they see, all right, when he was outside leverage, he got beat. Or if they saw when we put him in motion, he can't cover. You know, that's where they were going to attack me. Yeah. So I would look at my worst plays. People always look for themselves. It's just like social media now. What are you doing on social media? You're taking pictures and you're putting your best pictures out there, right? <laughs> and filters. I, I, <laughs> I, I put my worst stuff out there. That's what stuck in my mind. It wasn't my best. I made plenty of plays. Yeah. It was a play that I didn't make that yeah. stuck with me. Those are the ones I took notes on. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, yeah. and that's why I like today. Like today, when I, I have young corners that call me and say, hey, can you can you help me out or can you train me or something like that? The first thing I ask them, I say, send me some film so I can watch you play. And they'll be like, okay. And of course, they send me a highlight tape and I call them immediately. I ain't watching that crap. Send me the plays you got beat on. Mm. I don't want to see your highlight tape. Anybody can send a highlight tape. Send your best, you know? your strengths. Yeah, yeah, that's your best. Send me your works because that's what I want to work on. I want to see what you are not good at. Got it. So that's why you make a difference. Yeah. If I see what you are good at and I continue to work on that, I'm not making a difference. Yep. <laughs> so I would say send me your worst plays. So that's what I did, you know, when I got to the league. I looked at the worst rate. I looked at the worst rate because that's what the coaches are looking at, the opposition. They're looking at the worst rate, and that's what they're going to attack. Love it. Ray, I put this picture up the other day. It wasn't my very best. Maybe you might have an opinion on it, but uh, I, I put this picture up, and it was a picture of my feet. I, it might be some ashy ankles there, some ashy. You know, I remember, yeah, I'm, that was your worst. I saw it. <laughs> that, that was, yeah, yeah. That, <laughs> look, I, I'm going to be real with you, Matt. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thing called your worst worst. That's your worst worst. I wouldn't put that up. I just want to see your worst. I want to see your worst worst. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my feet got COVID, man. <laughs> look, you ain't lying. Look, that's, that's, first, that's your first four days of COVID. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, you so, look, man. I, 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 I said you were very brave to do that. <laughs> I give you, look, I give you credit. You're a brave dude. That right there lets me know that you're going to be very successful. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, man. Now, I, w I want to ask you because you know you get to the you get to the pros, right? And you're, you're on the you're, you got you got Elway, Romanowski, Atwater, Shannon Sharp, you know Mike Schlereth, who was working on NFL Network these days, right. Rod Smith. You get all these top performers, players. You know you get, you get drafted to to to, the Detro the, to Detroit. You know, and you get all these players are, are the best of the best, physically gifted. They got drafted. Boom. How, how did you go about dealing with egos? How did you? How did you? How did you manage uh, egos to to say, "Hey guys, let's win a championship"? Right. Well, see, here, here's the thing: it, it's it's not necessarily about managing egos. It, it's really about just managing people. And and I say it, it's a it's a collective thing. It it really has everybody's going because here's the thing: when people say manage egos, that almost has a negative connotation. That almost says that you have to tame people, you know what I'm saying? That you have to bring people down or you know, when you say manage ego, I want you to have an ego. I want you right, to Right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I need that. I, I need you next to me 
cocky and confident yeah. and, and ready to do Heck your yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. But but what I all but I what I need is is respect within that. You know, respect within that. There's a time and a place for all of our egos to exist. We just have to understand when that time is. Yeah. You know, we, we can't you can't just display all that testosterone and all that ego for no reason. You know. So for us, it was about managing people and coexisting. Yeah. Under, and the only way you get to manage people is to communicate. It's to get to know. You can't be afraid to get to know a person. Like for me, I I always and I was, you know, fortunate enough to be a captain in high school, college, and the pros on the Super Bowl teams. I was a captain. So for me, I would always take my guys out, and and yep. and I want to see what what makes you tick. Yep. It doesn't mean I'm gonna like everybody, and mm -hmm. that's what people don't understand. You don't have to like everybody to be successful and to be in a partnership or to be on a team with that person. You just mm -hmm. have to respect everybody. Yeah, I respected everybody that I, that was on our team. I respected everybody that I talked to, I spoke with, and I, and and I communicated. I was not. It's kind of like where we are now as a world. Yep. You know, like where we are now as a world. Racism and all this stuff that we're talking about, that is really about people. It ain't, it's not about black or white. It's about people in general. Mm -hmm. and, and then the bottom line is you can't be afraid to communicate. You can't be afraid to have the tough conversations because it doesn't mean you have to like me to respect me. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. like, and the way you get to like someone, the way you get to respect somebody is to is to communicate with them. So that's that's what we did with with our egos, with with who we were, with our black white, with our being straight or gay, because there were gay people in the league at that time. You know, hey, yeah, there were white people, there were blacks, there were Mexicans, there were there were, there were uh, Nico Nogas and all those guys from Hawaii. You know. <laughs> we had you know, there was a plethora of, of guys with different backgrounds and different religions and all of that stuff. So you just respected it. You know what I'm saying? I remember my one of my best friends to this day is Darian Gordon. Uh, he changed his name to Jamal, but you know he, he was you know his religion was different. You know he was a Muslim. Got so, it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So it was one of those things where I respected him though. You know what I'm saying? When he was in his locker playing to, with the whole of Quran or whatever, I respected that. And I didn't make fun of it or I didn't, you know, but we communicated about it, yeah. which was so cool was that because to me, I feel there's nothing gained from communication, but knowledge is just really no, there's really no loss there. There's really nothing you, unless you go into it with a different mindset, you know, in order to, to get along with people and in, in order to relate to people, you have to first and foremost, I always keep going back to you. Yeah. <laughs> you have to well, open your own mindset. You know, was, there, was there a certain expectation? For example, you line up on your guys. Was there a certain expectation you had of each other? Was the expectation to be at the meetings on time, to be in the workout rooms, to make sure they're diet? Did you have some minimum expectations that you expected amongst each other? And if, if they didn't meet those expectations, how did you call them out? Yeah, if you did. and that's the whole thing is that we had to make sure we had expectations across the board. Yeah. You know, there were no expectations for anyone – <laughs> that that wasn't for anyone else. You know what I'm saying? Now, don't get me wrong. <laughs> People got treated differently. John Elway, even I'll be honest, even myself, John Elway, Steve Water, Shannon Shaw, Terrell Davis, myself. Oh, there were some things we got to do that some of the <laughs> other players didn't get to do. <laughs> you well, know? you guys are going above and beyond. That's it. Yeah, but you're you're, 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 you're flag carrying for your team. Yeah, you have to understand the guys they depended on the most got, you know, relaxed, you know, treatment. But even us, whoever we were, there were expectations. We were going to be on time. Now, that kind of stuff was stuff that you don't tolerate. There has to be a, a there has to be a guideline that everyone falls into. Okay. Everyone. And then you play your way into better situations. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Better treatment. You play your way into days off. Like for me and John Elway and Shannon, training camp i only had to practice like we had two days i only practiced once a day <laughs> but i played my way into that sure it's, it wasn't you know, for your first year yeah exactly that wasn't something that grant that granted to me when i first got to denver i took three days in denver when i first got there but by my second third year and they knew they could trust that i was going to be on time 
They knew they could trust that I could go to Dallas because I didn't even, I didn't work out in Denver. I came home every offseason. I came to Dallas, but Shanahan didn't allow that my first year. Yeah, he made me. I had to stay in Denver. Yeah, but once he saw my work ethic, he said, "You know what, Ray, go home, go to Dallas because I know for 14 years straight, when I showed up at camp, training camp, Chip. I was 185 pounds." I was 7.2, 7.3% body fat, 14 years straight. That's what I was. You know what I'm saying? Book it. That's what I was. Right now, today. Now, my body fat has changed, but I'm 185 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, man. Now, look, the body fat is shifting. Weight is still it's the still same. same. Weight is still right. the same. But, so it's that's the kind of things, you know, those are the expectations, you know, you you in your character you build certain things yep. and you have certain guidelines that everyone must follow yep but then after those guidelines like you said be on time 110 percent effort you know yep. knowing what the hell you're supposed to do being mentally That's astute you know what i'm saying all those things come into play respecting the person next to you doing your job you know doing your job because everybody understands this is not basketball where Michael Jordan can take over a game. Football is quite different. At any given moment, if you decide that you don't want to do your job, the play is messed up because we got to cover 50 yeah. <laughs> plus here and 120 here. And it's going to be it's, obvious you didn't do your job. It's obvious. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because every man, you got to think about it. There's 11 guys on the field. So basically, if you are if, if you are, are like me, if you into numbers and, and math and things of that nature, you break a field down. Yeah. So when you say if there are six guys in the front, or, or let's just say there's five guys in the front line, right? Yep. And there's seven guys here, and there's four guys, you got 15 feet wide and this distance to cover. You got and if you're not there, it's open. It's Boom. obvious you're not there. quarterback sees that now opening. It's obvious that you're not. So that's why it comes, you know, into do that's why the Patriots had this big do your job. Because yeah. it's gonna be obvious in if that you did. Yeah. It's different in business sometimes. Yep. You know, that guy who was supposed to fax those things, sometimes he can get away with not doing it because yeah. football is different. Gotcha. You can't get away with not doing your job. It's sure. got to be done. If you're an offensive tackle and, and you're not blocking, the world's going to know. No, yeah. quarterback <laughs> <get hit. laughs> you know Your man? quarterback will have some choice words for you. Um, there you go. Yeah. So so those guidelines, you have to set base guidelines that everybody from everybody has to follow. Base guidelines. And then you work your way into everything else, good or bad. Because you can work your look. You can work your way into something bad. If you're not doing your job, not doing enough work, you got to be at the stadium more. You got to be in the film room more. You got to be on the field more. You know what I'm saying? So you can yeah. work your way into good or bad situations. Ray, as a cornerback, you know, they always have they always have a saying for uh, cornerbacks, have a short memory, you know? And so, you know, you get toasted out of the play, you know, a wide receiver burns you, they score a touchdown, whatever the case may be, uh, 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 they, they score a touchdown on that play. How do you how do you recover from a setback? How do you recover from a failure? How do you recover from being embarrassed? Because as you said, if you didn't do your job, wide receivers wide open, quarterback sees it, and, and he, he's burning you for for a touchdown. How do you recover mentally when you're in the middle of the game? How do you recover from failure and pain, embarrassment? And see, here, here's the thing that that I would say to Matt. For me, I always, like I said, I would take that a step further. Okay. I would take that a step for it's not have a short memory. It's have no memory. <laughs> it's have no memory because during the game, then during the game, my I'm always focused forward during the game. You know what I'm saying? I have no memory of good plays or bad plays. <laughs> so, so therefore, wow, it's both feel. ways, both ways. Yeah, it's both ways. I have no memory of good plays or bad plays. Now, during I'm saying during the game. Yeah, right, right. During the game, I want to stay on an even kill. I don't want you to know if I got beat or if I just made a play. I just want you to know I'm ready for the next one. <laughs> so that's why I had no memory. You know, if you if, if you have memory of your good plays or memory of your bad plays, you can't be ready for it. Yeah. You can't be. So for me, I had no memory. I just wanted you to know the next play. Everything to me was next play, next play, next play, next play, next play, until the plays were over. 
then I would go back. And that's when I had great memory. I knew I played a good game or a bad game or whatever. I knew every play, every six, you know, all those 65 plays, I knew them all. But during the game, I had no memory. It's not a short memory. You have to have no memory because you got to be ready for that next play. Ray, were you a smack talker? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, for of sure. course, of course, for sure. How, how, and, and how, some, give me some, give me some of the juice, man. What would you say? Well, see, here, here's the thing. I, I would never, I wasn't a smack talker necessarily to my opposition. I really talk to keep my sanity because wow. the corner, cornerback is a very lonely position. If you're good, now if you're bad. You ain't gonna need to say nothing. You better shut the hell up because they coming at you every play. <laughs> Look, but if you're good, if you get to that point where you're good, and I was fortunate enough to get there where I knew I was good, they only attack me on certain occasions. You know, they only attack me on trick plays and double moves and 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 you know when when Michael Irvin or somebody would come and move. So I had to talk during the game to keep myself up. Because it, at corner, like I said, you're out there on an island. You're isolated. You could get bored, and, and, and we already know. Everybody knows the devil. Look, <laughs> we know that when, when you're isolated, that's the devil's workshop. You know what I'm saying? So what would you, what would you tell yourself then? What, what would you say? What would you say to yourself to keep yourself on cue? I would, I would be – I would literally, man, it, it would be funny too. I would literally be walking around. <laughs> I would literally be walking around and, and – I would purposely be saying stuff in front of the wide receiver to make him think I'm talking to him. Give me, give me so, an idea. Give us yeah, all like, an idea, like, man. I, like I walk, like I walk around, I'll be like, man, this cake, this this cake, this this is you know, this light work. You know what I'm saying? I'm blowing out the candles. You know, I'll be, I'll be <laughs> you know, and look, and then he he look over at me and hear me saying, I'll be like, man, this 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 you know, this lightweight. I'll be like, really? I, I wish, look, I'll be like. <laughs> One time, this one receiver, I knew on purpose that he weighed 220. He weighed 220. So I would be walking from the sideline with him, and I'd be like, man, you do 220 for your warm-up. 220 your warm-up in the weight room. 220 your warm-up. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Jeez. So, so I, get I would it. talk to myself, but i let him know, oh, I know you exist. I know yeah. you over there. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. So, I mean – and, so and it, like, it was if I almost knew a like guy a, was slow, like yeah. if I knew a guy was slow, like one time me and Michael Irvin, we was going at it. And I knew Michael Irvin ran like four six, five or four six or something like that. And I'd be like, he wasn't they wasn't even throwing him the ball that much. And I would be walking by and I'd be like, Man, you run four six backwards. You run four six backwards, you know. <laughs> so so I knew he heard me, you know, stuff yeah. like that. That's kind of yeah. how I would trash talk. I would yeah. trash talk to get me up, but I would trash talk to let you know I know about you, too. You know what gotcha. I'm saying? I know your stats. I know your size. I know your speed. I know your strength, you know. So I, I would do stuff like that. Wow. Wow. So you went to, you, you went to talk about nobody's mama, but uh, you, uh, you, you, you talk about – Well, I mean, it, it depends on what you brought to me. Oh, okay, now, okay. I'm gifted with the tongue now. <laughs> I, I, I have the gift of gab, but I, I would not utilize that. Unless you got, if you get slick with it, I'll got slicker with it. <laughs> who, 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 was, who, who was the biggest smack talker that you ever ever, ever played against? Who's, Chris who's Carter a, by far, Hall of Famer. Chris Carter, wide receiver. Really, Vikings by far, by far. And 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 you guys about Vikings, the same height? No, so he could. He and and Randy Moss. Randy Moss was a big time. I let, let me tell you, <laughs> this this is a funny story. When, when Randy Moss and Chris Carter and Jake Reed played for the Minnesota Vikings. When I tell you, best wide receiver crew ever, ever, hands down, collectively. Wow. Collectively, as yeah. a group of wide receivers. You're talking about two Hall of Famers. And Jake Reed, who was who's Dale Carter, who was all, you know, all pro, was his brother. Jake Reed was like 6'4", 215, 4440. I mean, you're talking about spec. All those guys were at least 6'4". All three of those wide Chris Carter was in the slot at six five. So you're talking about a, a wide receiver duo that it was a shame that they laid the egg against the Falcons. But the year we were gonna play them, that year we would have played them in the Super Bowl had they won. We ended up playing the Falcons and just killing them. But 
I saw Chris Carter and, and Jake Reed and Randy Moss. I, I flew to Minnesota for a little autograph session. And I saw him out. And <laughs> Randy Moss, we all at the autograph session together. Randy Moss is like, hey, right. Hey, right. Boy, you better hope we don't see y'all because you're too little. You're too little. I'll dominate you. <laughs> okay. Okay. So okay. he was already talking noise before the game. This is like six weeks before we before even had the playoffs. They already talk. Chris, uh, look, Randy Moss and Chris Carter were, were top of the line smack talkers for sure. Nice. I love it, man. I love fortunate, it. Look, fortunate for me, I ain't have to see him. <laughs> <laughs> we played him the next year, though. We played him the next year and went at it. It was a hell of a game. We went we went at it, and uh, they ended up beating us by three on a dang block field goal, but we went at it that next year. Yeah, that next year. But they, they you know, most guys didn't really talk a lot of smack, though, but Andre Risen, Andre Risen really? was, smack, was one of the best. Eighty one, huh? Oh yeah, yeah Andre yeah. Risen was a dude too. Yeah. He was, he was, he he in my opinion, had he not have gotten all that, he he'd be up for the Hall of Fame. I mean, he went to five, six, seven Pro Bowls, or something. He was, but he was a smack talker. But yeah. it you know what? It wasn't many. Like I said, most of the guys that knew you could play. You know, even if you necessarily wasn't Hall of Fame level or whatever, mm -hmm. but they knew. At any given down, yeah, you could shut them up. Yep, they didn't. They they really didn't talk smack. Like me and Michael Irvin, Michael Irvin didn't never talk smack to me because he knew on any given play, I take it to the house. You yep. might get me, but I'm gonna yep. get you. You know, so yeah. they were. It was a, just a mutual respect for most of us. Hey, Rick, I keep talking to you about on and on about this stuff. I love talking sports. I love talking finance, money, business, mental game. You know, character, smack talk. Uh, I love all that. And by the way, that embodies the whole entrepathlete, you know, my shirt. Because we are we treat business like a pro athlete. I'm a right. frustrated jock. So when you talk to me about this stuff, I'm taking the stuff in and I'm applying it to business. You know, I, so I mean, what I need, though, what I need for myself is, is just like you say, you're a frustrated athlete. Most athletes are going to be in business sooner or later. So we need those nuggets. How do you, and, and I'm at, turn for a second if I can. <laughs> how how do you put those things into business like how do you from a standpoint of shift the table yeah how do you shift the table from being a, a athlete's mindset because I feel that all athletes can be very successful in business yeah if they just use the same concepts and yes. the same mindset that they did but here's the problem is the how to yep Correct. You know what I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the key. Is the how to. Anybody can tell. Like I can tell you what I did as an athlete, but when it comes to how to, how do I switch that into my business world? Yeah, and, and it's a beautiful thing to say that because a athletes have two things going for them for life after sports, or or while they're leveraging their platform, right? Whether whether on the NBA, NFL, you know, Major League Baseball, whatnot, is thank God today for for social media. Right. Now, there's a couple uh, college athletes. That, How come you're not more in social media? Well, well, you know, I just don't want to manage this. Listen, your social media is it's it's bread and butter. Right. You know, uh, right now, if you're not leveraging social media, it, that's that's how people get to know you, and it is a social media world. So, where, therefore, when you when you're done playing, you know, you continue that you continue that momentum, okay. right? And you're. So do you feel? Do you feel you cannot be successful in business now without? social media without utilizing I'm saying without somehow some way utilizing some form of platform or I, I, I don't I don't think so here's why because the other your competition is out communicating you your competition right. is, is out they're, they're just writing more plays than you are you're not, you're not even getting off the line yet okay it's, it's like they're playing offense defense even got the sidelines and they're, they're just moving the ball forward boom psh, boom psh, right because there's no so you got to create that that um it, it's the medium. It's a uh, remember in business marketing, and that's what social media allows us to do. Marketing is the lifeblood of any business. Right. Right. You know. You know. If if you're a team that doesn't know how to tackle, then you know. Good luck wrapping on and bringing it to the ground. That's that's what's exactly. happening. Okay. So so from a second standpoint, the things that make athletes successful can be the same thing that makes us fearful in business. And when you look at athletes from a success standpoint of this is how we were on the field, 
Yeah. We had no fear, right? Yeah, yeah. But but we were perfectionists. Sure. Because you knew what you were working on. You knew that you were God given givenly blessed to play football. Yeah. And we don't know that we are blessed to be in business. Sure. So therefore there's an automatic fear factor of putting out something that is less than what you're accustomed to be, you know, to doing to right. putting out. So is there a such thing as bad content? Like you you're telling me of I course, need to yeah. Do, yeah. Yeah. People say put out content, content, but yeah. my fear or athlete's fear could be we don't want to look foolish because you don't know what you don't know. So yeah. is there a level of bad content that or should yeah. you just put out content? So I, I, I give you an, I give you an example. Right, I'm, I'm gonna turn over my camera just so you see to help me make sure I create good content. I don't have one person helping me out. I got I got I got two people helping me out. Hey, say hi guys. <laughs> What's going on, baby? Right? And 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 these guys, Alex Medina, Ivan Acuna, they keep me young. Uh huh. So I'm, I'm I'm always asking them, hey guys, uh, what's funny? What what's good content? What do you think somebody today would? So for me, Ray, uh, I know my strengths, but here's a cool part about business: I can hire my weakness. Right, right. I can hire my weakness, right? So, exactly. so, so that allows me still to present and still come to the line with with the with the with the with the with, with, the, with my next play. Right, right. And so, as long as I have my team around me, uh, and the thing about business is, it's not relegated to just you know you know a three and a half hour game, four hour game. I mean, you got a long month, you got a long quarter, you got a longer year. Right. So along the way, as long as you got your checks and balances, every time you go in, like what you're saying is, uh, you know, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're talking about how you play the game. Because in business, we got to make phone calls. We got to make contacts. Right. right. And, and, and you have to have no memory about how a bad call went or a good. You just know you got to you got to no matter what. Right. Right. If you were talking about earlier today, no matter what in business, there is a no matter what. No matter what today, good or bad. I'm not going to get too high on my highs and I get too low on my lows. But when the day is done, 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, I'm smoking my cigar. I don't advocate that, but that's what I do. Right, um, right, I'm, right. I'm, I'm going over I'm, my game I'm take. I'm right there with you. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the cigar lounge. <laughs> right? You're on the cigar lounge. I'm going over my game tape. I'm my condiment calls with Patrick Bet David every Tuesday morning, 10 o'clock to 1130. We're going over our game tape for the week. Okay. Once a month, we're going our game tape for the, for the, for the last month. We're about to okay. do it here in 15 minutes. We're going over a game tape for what happened last time. We call it a builder's call with all of our guys that, that had a certain amount of metrics. We're, 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 we're team huddled. It's our, it's our, it's a game tape session. Okay. So just translate everything. And just like business, it's a new sport. So this might be pop Warner, but here's the thing. You got pro money, right? right? You got pro experience, right? right? So you can accelerate this world of business a lot faster and, and, and by the way, Ray, as I wrap up, I need to ask you this question. I mean, what do you, what do you see in business? What do you see in insurance? And you're just getting licensed and all this good stuff. What, what do you see in, in this world, this context of, of what has opened your eyes? I mean, for me, everything that I do now and I've learned from over time, I mean, I, I, I've had some success in business. I've had some, some failures in business as well. And, and I've learned that I truly believe because I have a spiritual, you know, foundation and a spiritual background background i truly believe that i'm in help first like my mindset is if i'm helping someone eventually things will happen good for me so for this business the reason why i even liked it to begin was the name people yeah. helping people yeah I mean, and when i when i met with, with patrick and i and i saw and i went to see uh, the offices in addison and i looked at the name i'm like people helping people so the first thing I wanted to do was, how do how can I serve? How hmm. can I serve, and and how can I be of service? So that's what I looked at with this business. And when I saw that, okay, I could honestly, because me, I'm gonna be real when it comes to certain things. If I'm not, I'm not real motivated if I don't like it. <laughs> I'm yeah, not yeah. a, I I'm not a facade guy. Yeah. I don't care how much money it can make me. If I got to look at you on a day-to-day -day basis and I don't really believe in the product or I don't believe I'm helping you really in some form or fashion, you will know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It'll be written all over my face. <laughs> and, and I would be those guidelines that I talked about. I would be easily, you know, easy to break one of them. Because one day you might say, Ray, let's do a call. I don't really want to. 
because I'm yeah. not interested. You know, yeah. so I knew for me, this type of business had to be something that I was interested in first, that I knew was helping somebody first, and that I knew I could be of service and that somebody could really benefit from it. And wow. that was my key because, you know, there's a lot of multi-level marketing businesses out there that I know truly, you ain't really, you got to be a certain type of person to make money in multi-level marketing, you know? Yeah. But in this business, if you understand what the world is going on and what's going on in the world, then you know you of service, you know that, that you're serving and you're helping someone. And you know that anyone, anyone can be successful in this business if you know, if you have a true interest in it. And that's my first thing. My first thing was is to find the interest levels and then to understand to see if you can really serve and help people. Yeah. And within that, money can be made. I sure. always believe that if those first three things happen, money is going to find its way somehow, some way yeah. to you. Yeah. That's awesome, right? Listen, I, I, I uh, can't wait to get back down to Dallas. Uh, uh, we'll jam out and uh, grab some cigars together and... Uh, I I, uh, I love hearing your stories, man, because it's not only a combination of me reliving the game through your eyes, through 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 what you had on the field. I mean, I'm watching from TV. You 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 you, you, you did it, but right. I'm also seeing the, core, the, the 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 parallel to how right. I apply myself in business and um, in and uh, it's it's exciting times for us in business. I'm excited to have you you know, on board with PHP agency and getting licensed and all the good stuff. And, and more importantly, there's a lot more people out there to be blessed uh, by your example and uh, what you stand for in America today. And by the way, I didn't even get, have a chance yet to even talk to you much today about, you know, what's going on in the, the whole social unrest and social injustice. I, I will say this, um, the, the president, the president of the American college, well, my magazine, the, pre, the president of the American college happens to be African-American. Right. And the American college for financial planning, the first time ever, and an African American president is now the president of the American College of Financial Planning. Wow! And, he, and he, he he just says in an article in this month's Insurance Newsnet magazine how life insurance can cut the roots of racism. Wow. Life insurance can cut the roots of racism, and I think you would love that. I'll I'll, uh, I'll send you the link. You love it. I, I love for you to reach. It. Yeah, because it gives everybody an, an equal shot, man. Because at the end of the day, bro, I don't care what color. You know, it's one white, black, brown. Listen, if you don't got this, boom. If you don't got this, yeah, it, it tends to kind of help a lot of areas and solve a lot of problems. You know, it's, it's up there with auction, and, and it's important for people to know how to get richer each generation of their life and how to keep that money compounding and how to have a head start for the next generation ahead. So with that being said, Ray, I appreciate you. But as I, as I sign off, where can people find info? Where can people follow you, Ray? You have a website. Do you have a social media yeah, my, uh, my, uh, well, actually my email for the book that'll be coming out is, is three bump and run nine, three bump and run nine. And, uh, and that's at gmail.com. And then of course my, uh, my site is croc 39 is my Instagram, but then my, um, uh, my Twitter is, uh, at slick pick six 39 <laughs> at slick pick six 39. <laughs> Why 39 Ray? <laughs> hey, look, there's 39 chapters in the Bible, man. You look. Oh, right man, say it, say it, man. Right <laughs> Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Very good. Folks, hey, uh, I, man, I'm looking forward to being a part of the team. And, and I, like I said, for me, I, I think in business for, for other people as well, is don't fear your weaknesses. Find yeah. someone and, 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 like you said, join a team. That, yep. I think you're, you're, if anybody's out there thinking they're going to do it about themselves nowadays and this is in, in this climate, you're not going to be successful. Find your team and go to work. That's, it. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. Appreciate you, Ray. Thanks, Appreciate baby. your time. Appreciate you. I'm glad you're getting better, man. Healthy, strong, getting after it, man. Hey, I'm trying. <laughs> and for those of you watching this, if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like, follow our business page. If you're going to be watching this on on uh, YouTube, make sure you click subscribe, hit notification, be uploaded next time we upload our next episode. And just to let you guys know, we got the next episode coming up. We have uh, we have a gentleman here that played for the Chicago Bears, Notre Dame great. Ray, you might know him, Chris Zorich. Uh, yeah, he's going to be in the next. Chris, yeah. Hello. Chris yes. A player rep with me. Tell awesome. Me hello. So he's coming to our next show on YouTube. So make sure you click subscribe, hit notifications, and drop your thoughts, drop your questions, drop your comments. Let me know what you're thinking. 
That being said, I'm gonna have just let everybody know. Respect everyone. Communicate with everyone. Life will be better. Oh, <laughs> that's it, man. That's it. I'm gonna have Ray Crockett. I'm your money smart guy here in the Seven Figure Squad. Until we meet again. Continue to live smart. Continue to love smart and be money smart today.